What's up fam, Raif Darazi here, and today I have the honor and the privilege of getting to sit down and chat with Adam Castillejo. Um, he is known as the London Patient. Thank you so much for agreeing to have this chat with me today. Thank you for having me. I am so delighted to be here in LA having a conversation with yeah, you. Yeah, you have, it's great. I mean, you have such a, an insanely busy schedule. I know you do. You're here for like <laughs> two, three days. Yeah, in LA, yeah, three days. And you yeah. managed to carve out <laughs> Three hours just for me, just for this. So I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. I think it's important yeah. to kind of keep the message and mm -hmm. to continue your work and continue, you know, to to express my message. I think yes, yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and you really are doing like a lot. You're doing the most, and that's <laughs> what we need. Yeah. Because <laughs> um, you could have just taken this experience and then said, "Okay, I'm done. I, you know, I'm." I'm cured. I want to go back to my life. Everybody leave me alone and just lived your life. And that would have been totally fine and acceptable. Yeah, of course. But I think in my case, I decide, um, first of all, the my responsibility to science. And I think to be cured of HIV is beyond me. It's just, um, it would be egoistic of me not to share my story and my journey. Because I think in our community, um, we need to have role models, we need to have inspirations, mm -hmm. and we need to be inspired. And I think that's something we're missing, and, I, and I'm passionate about that. And, yeah. I, and, I, and I want to help all the advocates and all the activists yeah. in their work. And that's what I, I'm trying to do in this US tour. Yes, I love it. That's what we need more of. Um, so we, and we've, Kind of chatted a bit back yeah. and forth on social media. We've been yeah. in touch for a while. Yeah, we have. This is the first time we've met, so we'll have to do this again next time when you have of more course. time. Yes, I'm looking to forward to going back to LA in, in a more yeah. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> um, so I, but I just want to start off by getting to know your history, your yeah. personal life. If you don't mind sharing, yeah, of course. where are you from? Where did you grow up? Things like that. So I grew up in Caracas, uh, in Venezuela, mm. as a child. So I, I was obviously, you know, it was, you know, I didn't have any knowledge about the HIV pandemic at that time. So I grew up there in, in, in my early childhood. And then I moved as a teen to Europe. I think because... What prompted that move? I think because my family are European. So okay. I had to send this Spanish and Dutch. So I think my surname, my surname tells you it all, Castilejo. <laughs> you know, I was born in the Netherlands. Oh, did you? Yeah. Oh, wow. Utrecht. Utrecht? Yeah. Oh, OK. So my family is from Amsterdam, and then some of them are from the islands, mm -hmm. from the Dutch islands. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like connection with Venezuela. That's why okay. my family, my grandfather moved from the Dutch islands to Venezuela in the 1940s. Uh, that's when my story, that's when I'm born in Venezuela. Sprake in Netherlands? No. Klein Mädchen? No, no. It's a shame. That's all I know. I'm shamed. That's all I know. I'm sorry, so guys. No sorry. words. So I'm in the same boat. I shoot, I shoot. Um, my granddad told me, no, you don't need to speak Dutch, you need to speak English, and that would be better. But now, going back to Holland many, many times, yeah. I feel the need, I need to learn my language. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I'm born in Venezuela in, and I moved as an early teens uh, to Europe um, and then I've been there ever since. So because for me it was a part of who I am, I think uh, being in South America, I, I didn't feel right for me. It wasn't mm. the right fix for me and I moved. Yeah, so I was a late teen, and I haven't, I only been back to that country once. Wow. And a lot of people ask me about that part of my life, and I think, yeah, it was wonderful. I have a great memory. I, I, I can tell you, I, I did, as a child, uh, no, no many people will do that. You know, people know about the Angel Falls. You know the Angel Falls? Mm -mm. That's the longest fall in the world. The waterfall? The waterfall, okay. yes, correct. So the angel fall. So I spent my childhood as a kid with my dad. My father was a pilot. So we spent years flying around in like, a, um, yeah, I have a wonderful memory of my childhood. But uh, um, yeah, I moved 
as a late teens. And by yourself or with your family? I moved by myself. My family's already, some of my, my relatives already in Europe, uh -huh. and then the rest of my family moved okay. later on. Yeah. Okay, great. And so do you have citizenship? Yeah, I have multinationalities. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> I have dual nationalities, yes. Well, I love, um, I love when people who are advocating and bringing visibility to those of us living with HIV have multi-ethnic backgrounds. Yes. Because I find when we're creating content and, and doing videos like this, yeah. people watching, they look, they're looking for someone who has their background. Yes, they so can identify. Yes. Yeah. People from Europe who say, oh, yeah, you're like me. Like, yeah, you're like me, exactly. Yeah. And I think I, I, I get a lot of that not only from the Hispanic community, I think the same as a role model. Uh, role model sorry. Yeah. And I'm just now I received from Post Magazine, I was nominated one of the 100 most influential from Post for the Latin community, and I was Amazing. very delighted to, to accept that nomination. And, you know, because I want to help the Spanish community. Yeah. But at the same time, I get people from Africa, people from Asia, from the mm -hmm. Philippines, mm -hmm. because they, feel, they identify with me. Yeah. And I think we have skin color, and exactly. a lot of people yeah. identify with us, and, 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 and with me they identify, because, oh, you're one of us. Mm -hmm. And I remember people from South Africa, contacted me, called me and said, oh, finally, it's not somebody white. white exactly. Yeah. And I think for them, it means a lot. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure I still inspire them and continue working yeah. to inspire them. And to feel, because people contact me and say, oh, Adam, I, how you feel? And I say, listen, you're going to find a cure. We're going to find a cure for you. Wait, don't lose your hope. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And growing up, what what were you interested in? Did you go to school? Did you? Yeah, I went to school. I went to private school, and I was lucky enough to to do that. And I, you know, I think looking back, I I wish I had better um, um, kind of guidance from the school system, because if, as, as a kid. And that's still in Europe. No, that was in in South America. I think that I wish okay. I had a better. Just uh, my in, in my late teens, I was mm, I was very direct. But I, as a child, mm. I think I wish I had more uh, elementary. I wish I had more uh, guidance, like uh, you have in Europe. Kind of get direction with that. I want to be an architect oh. uh, to begin with, uh, and then and then I said, no, I don't want to be an architect. Or I want to be. I think in in my side, I have to be. Oh. I inspired to be my family trait. My father was a pilot, mm -hmm. and my granddad a pilot too. So it was a family trait, mm -hmm. you have to become a pilot. <laughs> and I did it. So <laughs> I'm so sure that went well. It went well, but uh, yes. <laughs> I think that was the dream for them to be, be a pilot. But um, no, I think my childhood, it was uh, a normal one, like I expected uh, like any other child um, living in a, in a middle class upbringing and I yeah that was me mm -hmm. as a child and what about when you so you moved to to Europe to the yeah. Netherlands I moved actually to Denmark oh okay yeah my best friend is, is the Danish and then I moved to the um, I decided not to move to the Netherlands to my family mm -hmm. because you wanted some independence yeah I want my independence <laughs> I was, exactly and Europe <laughs> is small enough that if you go to another country you're basically a couple hours away yeah you can go there <laughs> yeah, exactly so I decided no let, let me do something different um, and I moved there and uh, I had the, the choices to move to Spain because I speak Spanish to speak to go to England because I speak English, or to go to Holland mm -hmm. because my family. But I think in my case, I thought, as a teenager, what do you want to do in your life? Mm, London is the best. And I think for me, um, proud British man, uh, I felt like that was the right call for me. Did you go to university? I went to college in, in England. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you study? I went for. Culinary school, so I'm a professional oh. chef. So, oh, wow. so I went to to uni to study that for a couple of years. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I'm a chef at Trey. Very cool. Yeah. I, I want to um, being the chef. I want to now incorporate in my in my lifestyle now to to help people how to be healthy. Ah. 
because I'm a transplant nutrition's wife about trans because I'm a transplant mm -hmm. recovering from cancer um, about HIV I healthy that. so I, I will do that in the future so that's something coming later good okay so before you were diagnosed with cancer mm -hmm. Hodgkin's lymphoma yeah you were diagnosed with HIV yeah when when did that happen? What was the circumstances there? So I was I know in two thousand and three in London. I you know I was in a relationship and I think that was important to kind of know your status. Mm. And I think um, in Europe, I think it's a, it, it, that consciousness about know your status. And you know I and I went to have my diagnose the test. Sorry, and the result. And I was shock when I gave a positive result. So you had already been in a relationship for in, in this relationship for a while? No, no, no. We were in, embarked. Just in, embarked. And so you decided to go get tested. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, because I think being in the North European mindset is kind of very well as you're going to embark in a relationship with I I really suggest to people to do that. Yeah. If you're going to embark in a new relationship, know your status. Yeah. Do it together. Be do it together. Because you're going to work in that relationship, but that's really important to do that. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it means opportunities yeah. because you don't know if you are transmitting somebody. So in my case, I was I know that was very tragic for me. And at, this, at that time, there's no prep. It was nothing. There was nothing. So for me, in my case, guys, I was diagnosed with HIV, and I've been told I only have ten years to live. Oh. And if you were lucky, you get 20. And then the worst thing they say to me, now go and enjoy your life, the yeah. rest of your life. I'm thinking, how going to do yeah. that? What do you do now? And I felt like a death sentence yeah. for me. And I felt, um, wow, my life is over. And I was so fortunate to have a partner at the time who told me, Adam, if you're HIV, that doesn't matter. I still love you. You're still wow. who you are. And no matter what. And wow. that was the key. And I was fortunate, that's what I say, because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't get that. No. And for the first time after my diagnosis, I felt human again. Because when I get a diagnosis, I felt, the, I felt dirty, I mm -hmm. felt uh, shameful, I felt... Um, the, the society and even the people around, all the medical people who were here you know, diagnosed, make you feel guilty. It's like it's your fault. You go yeah. HIV, so yeah. deal with it. Like you're contributing to the problem. Yeah. So we're not going to give you an easy ride. <laughs> yeah. But that was in the early no in, in, in the notice. Let's bear in mind, we just came out from the 90s when if you have a diagnosis, you will die. Yeah. Basically, so we were step forward, mm -hmm. but I have to endure like telling me you're going to die. Yeah. The medical community didn't quite catch up at that point. No, yeah, it was it's 2003. We just came out of the 90s. Yeah. And we were just fighting for medication. We were fighting to get to have good treatment. So, um, to tell somebody in at that time you're going to die. <laughs> and then they tell you next sentence is go and enjoy it. Do you know what your treatment was at that time? No, because you don't have treatment. There was zero treatment. No, because the policies at that time in the United in, in the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. I cannot I cannot talk about any anywhere else, but probably in Europe will be the same. We have the policies if you are HIV now you don't need to have medication or until you drop into certain level. I remember that. Which we don't do that now. Yeah. Uh, but that was that was yeah. known at that time. Yeah, so. for for the folks at home watching, there was a period where when you were diagnosed, you were not immediately put on on treatment, presumably because tr the treatment was more toxic. Exactly. And so there was a higher risk to put you on medication. So they would wait until you were ill. You were really ill, like yeah. AIDS, before they would put you on treatment. Which is crazy today to think yeah, about it's it. Crazy. But that was the. Evolvement. That's what the HIV treatment evolved from there to where we are now. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So 
<coughs> and me. then you have to go into that uh, mindset knowing today's society, if you are HIV, you have to be medication because now we have you equals you. Yeah. And you're untransmissible, you want to be undetectable, you want to infect anybody. Mm -hmm. At that time, that was no part of the, of the journey of anybody with HIV. So, yeah, it was very difficult because now you know you are toxic. But you have to be more careful um, to have safe sex and to tell future partners you are HIV positive. And, and that narrative has changed completely today. Now we have medication. As soon as you're being diagnosed, you enter medication, make sure you're undetectable, yes. and that. And that is huge, huge changes from Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So you, you were diagnosed. Fortunately, you were in a relationship with mm -hmm. a very understanding partner and supportive. The doctors told you, live your life however you want. Like, do your bucket list, basically. Exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> did your Which I did in my bucket list, by the way. Did you? <laughs> yeah. What was, what was something on your bucket list? I want to know. Yeah, what was on my bucket list? One of the first things, I think, um, being, having that terrible debt sentence, because that's what I call it. It was a debt sentence yeah. in 2003. My bucket list, it was to be... Um, I think it was give something back to my mother mm. um, to create memories. I never get emotional even to think about it I'm now back. Too. Because I thought I, I want to create memories. So I, too, I did something. I took her from the Grand Tour of Europe. So we spent months together making memories, making her dreams come true, things she wanted to see, I make sure she saw it. And then to remember one time we were, we were I think we were in Madrid, and we were, we were I was looking at a balcony in, 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 one, in one of the hotel we stay, and she looked at me and she said to me, are you okay, son? Because you sound with a lot of sadness, your eyes, Mm. tell something else and no, I'm fine. But she didn't realize I was having a death sentence. She didn't know. No. Because I didn't want her to, to, to struggle with that because I think it was important for her not to know at the time. You didn't want her to focus on that while you're trying to make happy memories. Yes. And I think, and then she understood later in time about that, but I, I, it was, it was difficult to, to, um, to give the, you give all yourself to make sure she have a good memory of you, because they told you you're going to die. Yeah. So you have to make sure whatever you do is that, and I was petrified because I started learning about the nineties about the pandemic, about yeah. the A-related, you know. And I saw all the stigma and all the, uh, that. So I, that was my bucket list, and I did manage to do that. And then t I decided, well, as I said, I was fortunate enough to have a partner who was able to help me. And I decided, well, I want to live the best life. So I decided to be very healthy, Training, exercising, cycling, running, gym, <laughs> having healthy lives, no alcohol, no smoking. Wow, really? So I embarking in, in, on that journey of self discovery. So um, enjoy my life. Um, I'm a keen skier, so I enjoy my skiing. I'm a keen cyclist, less enjoy my cycling. I'm a, I'm a like to travel, less travel. So that's, that's so interesting to me because. I feel that so many people would say, oh, I'm going to die? Okay, well then, who cares about my health? Who cares about my body? I'm just going to party, and I'm going to drink, and I'm going to trash myself because I'm going out anyway. I'm going to press that self-destructive button there. No, exactly. I didn't know. I did the know. opposite. Yes. Because I want to, I think I have 
in me the that's that's that I want to live. I don't want to die. I don't want to. I I, I don't want that diagnose to just eat me alive. Yeah. And I, but at the same time, right, I, the HIV treatment, it was changing. By the time we entered in 2010, I was already in treatment, and they told you, you're going to live a healthy life <laughs> to retirement. So thank God you were living <laughs> healthily. So, but then they said to me, you, you've been very healthy, you've been very, you look after your health, yeah. and, you know, I was, Really, the epidemic of health. I'm tell me, Adam, you look, you are doing better than people who are no HIV. So, and I was, for me, feeling great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. But I know everybody do that. Yeah. So that and that what you said you that was in 2010. Yeah, that's when everything was changing. Mm -hmm. right I was diagnosed with AIDS in 2012. Okay. I think I just missed the prep boat as well. Okay. I think by like a year or two. Um, okay, so at this point, you're living in London mm -hmm. with your boyfriend still? Are you still together? Uh, no, I was already single. Okay. So you're living your life healthy. I think, yeah, we were, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, at what point did you start feeling sick regarding the lymphoma? Um... I was in another relationship, uh, now I, I, as I recall, so I was in another relationship, and mm -hmm. I was, as again, the epitome of health, exercising, training in the gym like a crazy one, every four or five times a week, cycling, running, mm -hmm. skiing, you know, eating super healthy, yeah. and I did not feel anything. And that is one of the reasons why I'm passionate about talking about cancer and HIV. Because in our community, we don't tell HIV patients, you are three times more likely to have cancer. And we don't I did tell not that. know that. And we don't tell people that. <laughs> so this is a tangent, the side little side note, but I just I just got back from San Francisco yeah. with the Hope Collaboratory, Patricia, yes. you know. Yeah. And talking with scientists and researchers, <clears throat> I was talking to a scientist who was talking about HIV proteins in the brain mm -hmm. that even when you're undetectable can impact your brain function and can give you a higher chance of dementia. And I told him, this is my issue with the medical community, is we are told either they're completely uninformed and they tell you, you got to watch everything. You could be at risk of dying. Uh -huh. Or you get the opposite where it's just like, you can live like anybody else. You're just fine. You're just normal. You're going to live a long, healthy life. You have nothing to worry about. Neither of those are true. <laughs> yes. It's somewhere in the middle. And I think we're at a place now where we can start being a little more honest yes. about the complexity of what it means to live with HIV, including, yeah. I had no idea. I, I have recently I learned, I learned that <laughs> in the hard way by the doctor, Hashley, telling me, the nurses and doctor, well, what you expected, your HIV, you are three times more likely to get, oh, that's news to me. News to me. Yeah, and, so, and a lot of the community doesn't tell that to people. We are three times more likely to, to develop cancers. I just had a conversation with someone who reached out to me and said, we're doing a campaign mm -hmm. for those who are immunocompromised with a focus on skin cancer. And I told her, I don't know if it really applies to me because I'm undetectable. There's really... An, it does apply to you. <laughs> so we're like, okay, sorry, I can't help you. We both were like, okay, well, thanks for trying. No, See you later. Good do, luck. It does apply to Here you. Here we are. Well, if you're watching, <laughs> let's reconnect, please. Yes. It, be Check yourself because you can get cancer, guys. So these are the Possible. nuances that we need to talk about now. Yeah. Because now, as a community, we're aging, we're growing with the virus, and we need to know all of these things that we need to be aware of. Yeah, because in my case, I was living a healthy life, yeah. so it was not suspected to, because I have a healthy lifestyle, doing not everything to right, develop cancer. But because you are HIV, the likelihood, genetically, of course, genes and, you know, for your background, yeah. that would help to contribute um, your lifestyle. 
would contribute about to have cancer. Mm -hmm. But it's there, that percentage mm. is there, and people don't talk about it. I learned it th through the medical team telling me, well, you should know this. Uh, nobody talk about this. Nobody. Nobody I've talk about it. I've never heard that. Yes, and when you hear it sitting on the table, and with the doctors and nurses telling you that, and you're like, oh, why didn't nobody told me this before? Why nobody saw it was relevant to tell exactly. you that? Because they are thinking, you to worry about HIV, don't want you to go back, you're going to, to worry about the next illness. Yeah. And try to live a healthy life with that, which I applaud and I support 100%. Mm -hmm. However, I think it's important to kind of highlight the things on the line. That on <laughs> I'm the sorry, line. hold on, I just farted. <laughs> Duke, are you done? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll just keep continuing from there. <laughs> I'm sorry if you smell. Yeah, keep it, keep it. <laughs> keep it fresh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thanks, Duke. Appreciate it. That's why I have a candle lit. So, yeah, I think um, FFA, um, to be part of them, having that conversation with the doctors about we don't have that type of conversation with the doctors about yeah. being having you have you can you had your HIV and you want to live a healthy life and mm -hmm. I support and upload and a hundred percent. However, and I think we need to kind of have different conversations about the implications of being HIV and immunosuppressed. Yeah. What has happened to your body? And to be vigilant. Yeah. I think it's about to be vigilant. Yeah. Not everybody will get cancer. No. That is, but one in three people will get cancer in their lifetime. And we don't talk about that. And it's always my fundamental belief that education is empowerment. It's a key, yeah. So you can withhold information, and that works to a certain degree to protect people. But at a certain point, I think in the long run, educating people is way more powerful than um, using fear or, or withholding. Monger, yeah. I think people, we live with fear, and I think um, we... It was, in, my, in some ways, it was necessary during the 80s epidemic to make people realize people are dying. This is important. You need to, you need to be aware. We're not yeah. in that place anymore. No. And I think um, being... I think you were diagnosed in 2012, Compared to 2002, that was a way 360 degree difference. Mm -hmm. um, but even so, <clears throat> I presume when you were diagnosed, they just tell you that you were not well informed. And I think a lot of people, no. when they get the HIV diagnosed, first of all, it's a life changing mm -hmm. moment for anybody. Mm -hmm. And I think, but I think now, I thought it is different because when you were in 2012 and now we're in 2022 it's even different now it's even more different now however i still see people um which i it was a case in london when i was informed um a, um, a refugee came to london and he was he had no idea he had he was hiv and for him and his memory, in his mind, he was transported to the 1980s. How? Yeah. Because they come from low and middle income countries mm -hmm. where education and, and awareness about HIV doesn't exist. It's and even necessary. access to healthcare. And healthcare, of course. And not even, as you say, education and knowledge about yeah. the progress of HIV. Yeah. For that individual, he was, he was a young person and he was like, um, I'm going to die. Yeah. And we had to, um, I was informed by the, from the people who were um, treating him to reassure him, no, yeah. we are not in the 80s, mm -hmm. you're not going to die for yeah. HIV, and you can live a healthy life and, and at the same time. And I was, in the back of my mind, I was thinking, but you will not tell him about the cancer risk. You just concentrate in one point right. at a time. But I, 
I still even to this has happened this year, the case in 2022, we still find people yeah. who have no idea about HIV. Yeah. Yeah, we and are. it's incredible oh, to, yeah. to see that. And that's what I want to work with the communities in, 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 in South America, mm -hmm. in Africa, yes. and Asia, because there's a lot of misinformation. And that's, and that's an important distinction is between Western societies and the rest of the world, because there's a huge disparity there between the overall general knowledge and the access to healthcare. Yeah. So when I say things like, oh, it's not like the 80s, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanna clarify, I'm mostly speaking about Western societies yeah. because in places like Africa, where it's just, and India and Southeast Asia, where it's just exploding, and the majority of the population is actually female, it's a completely different story. Yeah, and I think we, we as a society in the developing world we have the responsibility to to help the developed world. Now we go to the low, the low and middle income countries. We're supposed to support them and yeah. get their knowledge, but it's a very difficult, it's a huge task. But it's, it's as I say to many times, I've been privileged to be in the developing world, mm -hmm. being in the United Kingdom, I have uh, the NHS, the National Health Service, mm -hmm. which provides all of the things you need yeah. but that's not the case for the rest of the world mm. um, here in the US it's different you have the health get fisted but in in Africa is I hopefully in in the coming months I'm going to embark on a tour in Africa to to, to tackle misinformation mm -hmm. um, to tackle about the key issue about knowledge about HIV so uh, okay. so Let's get to the big topic, which is you are cured of HIV, correct? Yeah. How did that come about? How can about if a if, um, hard journey mm -hmm. and with a lot of twists and turns to get into that. Mm -hmm. So in 2015, I was diagnosed terminally ill and I was sent to a hospice mm -hmm. to die. Well, because my cancer, it was incurable, and there was no way to treat it. It was, I spent the whole time. So this, I'm sorry, but this is the second time in your life you have been sent off to go die, essentially. Yes. Yeah. How did that feel a second time? Um, you feel like, ah, uh, it's like, no. I am not. You're not telling me I'm going to really? die. You didn't yeah. have like a why me? I think I did that um, in the beginning when I have cancer. Mm. I had kind of a self pity, oh, why me, why me, uh, in the beginning. But then I realized no. And I think one distinction I want to mention to you when I have the HIV diagnosed, I was given, so when you have HIV, you have hate from everybody around you. Stigma. Stigma, you're shameful, it's your fault. When you have cancer, it's not your fault. Yes. Um, the support, the love, the caring, and it was overwhelming. And I want to tell people, it's still a human disease. Both HIV and cancer, a human disease, they deserve the same love and care and understanding. And people don't do that. Mm. And that's something I'm very, really keen on that. When I was diagnosed in 2015, uh, I, sorry, I was given that terminal diagnosis. Yeah. I was going to die. I didn't realize I was being discriminated. What do you mean? Because I was HIV positive, man, having cancer. So you're saying that they gave you a terminal diagnosis because of your HIV status? Because no simple as that, because when you are an HIV patient mm -hmm. and you have a cancer, the choices for you are limited because it's no enough data about treatments, it's not about research done, and the easy route is to, we have no, we are no, we have no experience 
instead of trying instead of trying yeah yeah wow so i my new medical team which i i go in touch they were willing to risk it mm. but they told me i only had 10% chance of survival mm. wow i got two choices die in the hospice or that 10% chance surviving. That was no uh, no brainer. <laughs> Where should I go for? Yeah. <laughs> so when it was a but complete straight answer. It's not it's not as if the 10% didn't come with its own risks or yeah, uh, not it was just risks but like it wouldn't be a pain-free process either. No. They, they told me, Adam, this is going to be very difficult, but we're, going to, we're willing to try if you're willing to try. Yeah. yeah. And we went ahead. But uh, when I realized that trigma is not available to our HIV community who struggle with cancer, it's not available. And why is that? Because it's not data. It's not, I have, doctor had no experience about mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Now we're getting better. Okay. But when I had the, the transplant, still a very, very new experimental. Experimental because we tried to replicate the dose the, the Berlin patient, mm -hmm. Timothy Raper, the late Timothy. So, and a lot of people before me have died trying. Really? Yes. Some people had died trying. Some people rebound the HIV. Oh wow! So I didn't know that. it was a lot of people behind before me. So a lot of people when they were successful. Mm. So I em embarked in that journey knowing the risk, yeah. and I know I could die mm -hmm. um, because when you are HIV, I'm cancer patient. The likelihood of complications is even greater because. You HIV treatment have to work with your chemo treatments, and then I change my medications in a regular basis mm. because they have to change. Mm. So I have to endure HIV consequent um, side effects and cancer treatment side effects mm. together and combined. So imagine the the noodle soup there all the time yeah. with different. You don't know which one is yeah. which. So I understand when the doctors are apprehensive to to suggest mm -hmm. that, but I feel like it, we need to make sure the doctors feel empowered mm -hmm. and to suggest. And that you have the ultimate choice. It's choice. No doctor, I'd rather die and I'm at my hospice, but you have a choice. Mm -hmm. And I think if my willpower, my determination not to die, I will be dead today. Yeah. But that is because I did that. And to learn there was a possibility out there and I was not being informed, that was the, the biggest shock for me yeah. to understand that. And I want to people to know that it, it happened yeah. because that was a positive discrimination. Right. Which is not because you've been discriminated, but in that way you are, that's a, you know when it's very difficult to to, f to figure out the discrimination because it's a positive discrimination. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to champion that too yeah. because I think it's important. That. And it's not just with things like that, but even as simple as I get a lot of um, folks reaching out saying they want to they be fit. Yeah. They want to exercise and they want to consider supplements and different things and their doctor says no, nothing, no. We're not even going to, you don't even have the option, you don't have the choice, we're not even going to consider it because you're positive. Yeah. Rather than working with you. Yeah. And I think, so that's prevalent. Yeah, it's prevalent in a, in a lot, in a lot of the doctors. It's, if you shouldn't embark on that, don't do that, it's going to, um, and I can see in a lot of uh, HIV patients, they, Every time when they're going to, they are in, in their minds about, oh, they're going to counteract my medication. This is going to be, yes. should I do it? Should I not do it? That, that's, that constant pressure mm -hmm. that you go there is, is, is very prevalent today. And to be your own advocate, that takes a lot of strength and persistence yeah. and self educating. Yeah. It's so a, not everybody can do that. People like, you're very strong and you're brave and you are persistent yeah 
A lot of people are not that way naturally, and that's okay. Yeah. But it's important that people like you and like myself who do have a little extra, we're a little, maybe we have more of a thick skin, we have more of a fire mm -hmm. where we don't take no, yeah. and we push that we Challenge. champion, like you said, we champion it so that we can kind of make the road a little easier for other people who don't necessarily have the means or the capability to do all of that. Yeah. And I think, yeah, because we have to give it the, the um, push, the kick mm -hmm. to people because um, we, we have to become role models for them and inspiration to yeah. people because, oh, oh, it's a way, oh, it's a... It's a different way to see it. Oh, oh, I didn't know this. So that is important yeah. to champion. Mm -hmm. And for me, as ambassador of hope, I am now I call myself as a global ambassador because it's, it's working with so many countries around the world. It's about to help the activists and the advocates mm -hmm. see, to work together and me supporting that yeah. because I'm a communicator yeah. and I want to put the conversation to, to governments, mm -hmm. to institutions, about changes. Yeah. And that's what I, I want to, because people ask me, oh, you're an activist. And I say, no, I'm not an activist. Are you an advocacy? No, I support everybody who do activism and advocacy. Mm -hmm. I, I do help them. I want to support them. And that's my role. Mm -hmm. and you, but you are all those things as well. Yeah, of course. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, when, when, when you are, um, as an ambassador, you are able to communicate, you are you able to, to go to places because people will see you in a different way mm -hmm. compared to if you are an activist. Kind of like a diplomat. Exactly. Like that. And that's, that's the way to kind of, to able to talk about cancer, to talk about, because at the same time, I want to talk about cancer, HIV, on our mental health. I love, I love that you said that because I've never thought about it like that, but it's more how I view myself because when you think about an activist specifically, an advocate to an extent, it's someone who is fighting for their community. Yes. As an ambassador, you're bridging. Exactly. That's, an, that's a good distinction. I love that. Yeah. And then, and that's what I, I, I try to convey that to people. So I'm a communicator. Mm -hmm. I want to mm, yes. get a message across. I want to help your message to be yes. delivered to the people mm -hmm. without confrontation, exactly. without that. Without judgment. Let's exactly. Not, let's not polarize. Let's exactly. not vilify anyone. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's what I'm... Um, like now, I work with the GTI. Um, it's a global gene therapy initiative, okay. which I'm, on a, uh, I'm a, an advisory board. Very great. And we work in, in different, we work about, about HIV, and we work about uh, sickle cells. Okay. Um, prior to this meeting, I was, I was in, a, in, a, in a meeting and talking about m my role as the face of the organization, because we want to make sure I can able to talk about sickle cells, I can able to talk about HIV, talking about different things. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's my role. Yeah. If, if I call myself an activist, the people will think of me now in one yes. direction. And that's, that's what exactly. I do not want to do that. Exactly. But I support 100% all the, all the activists in HIV, trans rights, mm -hmm. equal and mental health. Same. You know, I support all of them yeah. and all of the support and work. I think we're on the same page. Yeah, that's good. And so that brings me to what is what is your experience working with the HIV community and working with you know different organizations and stuff? What how is that? What has that experience been like for you? Um, it has been an eye opener. Okay. I um, I wish I can say it's been wonderfully um, excited. No, it hasn't. It's been an eye opener. It's been challenging. Okay, because that's surprising. Surprisingly, yeah, because I've been discriminated by my, our own community because I'm not part of the club anymore, because I'm cure. So you know, you not confine with our policies, we do not confine with our message. We we can we find it difficult to work with you mm -hmm. at this point in time. Yeah. 
And that's a reality with people. So people don't want to work with yeah, you? No, because I'm cure and it's, it doesn't work with their charities or their organizations. <laughs> yes. I, uh, I just, I find that so shocking. Uh, I'm just very disappointed and disheartened by that. I think I don't understand that. Um, what, why do you think, why, why do you think that is? What's your takeaway? <clears throat> um, fear. Okay. Of the um, changes. And I think they are frightened to, they're too set in, the, in, in their minds about treatment and to live a healthy life. And we, we have no change that. We, we still fixate in, in treatment, prevention, treatment, and we don't talk about cure. We need to talk about prevention, treatment, and cure. Um, it's very few organizations worldwide that are dedicated in today in the cure research. And I am involved currently with some event Mm -hmm. um, a funds in the Netherlands, and uh, they are just stepping ahead from that. Uh, another organization now, like Anfar, mm -hmm. they're stepping into the cure research, and they're stepping, they're doing a step forward into the. And, but another organizations are not willing to to move, and it's disappointed. It's disappointed because I can see what they do, and they try to kind of avoid me. So I want to dig into that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. You mentioned fear. Yeah. Um, that they want to focus, but there's something, there's a component I feel that's missing. What are they really afraid of? You want me to be frank? Yes. To lose at their jobs. Mm. And they lose the livelihood. That's what they're missing. That's what they're worried. That their whole purpose is, is finished. Is to find a cure. Mm. So there's no more purpose for them. And I think it is that it's so sad <clears throat> because it's so much work to do. I'm very happy to be cured of HIV. I want people to have the choice, mm. to have that, that choice of, you can have treatment, but you have a choice to be cured. Mm. And I want to see the next generation not to embark in the HIV journey. So you think on some level they don't even want the cure to happen? Yes, I, you know, I have to realize sad reality of that, to realize some people don't really want that. And even they try to tell you they do, but really they don't. Mm, and for example, wow. and it's, it's so, that was the biggest shock because I was discriminating being HIV man. I remember people telling me they don't want to be near me because I'm an HIV per person. Um, but to be discriminating for the people who are in the same boat as me, yeah. that was, I still, even to, even to this That's day, be I really still... really disappointing. Yeah. But I, I, I'm resilient. No. I... And say, no, I will not allow these organizations, or not even the organization, the bosses or their management to make me think twice. I think, no, you need, <laughs> sooner or later, that need to change. I'm glad you make that distinction too, because there are times when organizations are vilified for yeah. their behavior, things that they focus on, etc. But I like to remind folks that 99% of the people at the organization are good-hearted people who yes, care, hard working, caring, who want good results. But it's the leadership. Yes. Yeah. And some of the leaders, they will know what they want to engage with you. They will say to you, "Yes, of course, we're going to support you. We're here for you." Mm -hmm. Ah, that's a problem. When you ask, so can we, what can we do? Uh, um, not right now. We cannot do anything at this point in time. Let's do a bit later. 
and the years pass and still nothing happened. That blows my mind. And if people who say to you, uh, they go in a day to day talking about HIV, how wonderful the HIV life is, and you know, we're supposed to prevent and treatment, and you know, but cure is not a problem. So, and I've had my own suspicion about this kind of mentality myself, okay. just because I'm with my own experience, to be totally transparent. After I, before I was diagnosed, mm -hmm. I didn't have health insurance. I couldn't afford it. I didn't know how I was going to be able to afford it. I was waiting tables, you know. After I was diagnosed, I was able to get the best private health insurance that I could find. Mm -hmm. it, would, it would have been $800, $900 a month for the monthly premium. Completely covered, free, um, as a result of having HIV. So it, naturally, in my head, I think, wow. And I would joke, I would joke with my friends, too. I'd say, hey... You don't have health insurance? You want some free health insurance? I'll, gi I'll give you my HIV. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you win the lottery. You win the lottery. Uh, as a joke, but in reality, that's, a, that's a, a truth and a reality for a lot of people, a lot of minorities, um, people from low socioeconomic backgrounds mm -hmm. who, can't, who would never be able to dream of a, having a lot of um, government-subsidized programs. Mm -hmm. When they have HIV, suddenly they have access to health care, they have access to other treatments. They can get, you know, food assistance, a living assistance. There's so, there's a whole spectrum spectrum of services that are provided to you once you are okay. positive with HIV. And so, the prospect of a cure is a threat to all of that. Yeah. When I, I was just in San Francisco, like I said, one of the the of my other co-chair. She actually spoke up in front of the scientists and the researchers and everyone and, and said, people benefit from having HIV in those communities. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Um, but the thing is, for me, because I, I crossed the line from the HIV world to the HIV cure, yeah. and when you cross that line, and you, you thought you were going to be embraced and celebrate. Completely. And instead, a hero. I hear, and instead, you go the door closed. Thank you, but no thank you. Wow. And then you're thinking, wow, this happening before? And it do happen. It did happen to Timothy Ray Brown. It did? It did. Do you, com you communicate? Yeah, I did communicate with him before he died. Okay. So we have a lot of... I didn't know he passed away. Yeah, he passed That's away. my ignorance. He passed away in, uh, in 2021. Um, and he was struggling. Uh, and his cancer came back. And he died, sadly died. But in the developing world, um, in, in the Western world, in these fair world societies, we have we are privileged enough to to decide to be in treatment, yeah, and to be in a healthy life. Mm -hmm. The lower and middle income countries they have no da choice. Yes, they just want to be cured. They don't have access to treatment. Yeah. yeah. So for them, it's as a lie to their sentence. It's a still you're going to die with HIV and you're going to develop AIDS. Yeah. And we. We live in a society which I have to experience after being, because my journey with HIV, it was more private compared to now. And I think people don't realize, um, I think most people have a very private HIV journey. You don't tell so many people, you tell you only your closest friends and you live your, your life. Yeah. But for me now different, I thought that the, um, the changes of attitude towards how people talk to me. People have said to me, but I don't care about the big cure. Oh, that's a very hard pill to swallow, a hard pill to swallow when somebody tells you, but I don't care about when the they cure. Say, I don't care to be cured of HIV. I'm in treatment. I don't care to be cured of HIV. Okay. That arrogance to mm. even tell me that in my face. 
it, at the very least, it's insensitive to you. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's ignorance and arrogance that, of, their, of, of their mindset to even think, you've been privileged enough yeah. to able to say you're okay with treatment. Yeah. You know, it reminds me, it's, I don't want to equate the two, but it reminds me of with COVID, with vaccines. Yeah. We're privileged in the Western countries to even have access to vaccines, and yet this is where you will find the most resistance. I don't want a vaccine, and all the conspiracy theories and all that. Oh, yeah, yeah. And other countries, desperate to have Please, it. Please, give, <laughs> give me something. Give me something. People are dying. Exactly. And that is why, um, like myself, I'm, I got four COVID vaccinations or double, triple, quadruple <laughs> vaccinations. <laughs> and the next one, yes, I have it. <laughs> um, and yes, and people, as you say, people talk about, um, oh, I don't want it. Yeah. But I, people change the, the narrative with monkeypox. Mm. We go and game with that one. Mm. So it's kind of like we work on these perceptions. It's, oh, we can. Oh, do I need it? Do I want it? You have that privilege to yeah. go into that. Yeah. Do I need it? Do I want it? Mm -hmm. People in the lowly Northern countries, they have no choice. Yes. They will die for illnesses. Yeah. And, and then when I was going back to when somebody told me in, in, um, a couple of months ago, um, well, I don't care. I, I, I live in a healthy life with my HIV. I don't need to be cured. I remember that table went quiet, silent, mm -hmm. because how? You know, I, and this is, this is something that I have a conversation with folks who watch my content is mm -hmm. they're fixated on the cure. When's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? I'm going to be, I'm going to be in a state of panic and desperation until there's a cure. And I say, Live your life. Exactly. There's medicine. Don't worry about it. It'll come when it comes. But in the meantime, you can live your full, exactly. healthy life. That's very different than saying, if there's a cure, meh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm good. You will not say that with cancer. You will not say, if somebody tells you, you want to live your life with chemo regimes every That's other day? That's about something that the, the, the underlying reason is about something other than oh i'm fine on the medication it's not that's not the reason why there's something underneath and i i think we have now as a community a psychological attachment to hiv it's part of who we are exactly it defines our community yeah it gives us value it allows us to connect mm -hmm. and it's something that we We're all this pain we have pain and trauma we have a reason to fight Mm -hmm. If we lose that, we lose part of our identity. Yeah. We lose physically a part of our body. It becomes a part of you. It's in your cells. Yeah. We'll lose a part of who we are. And I think that's very scary for people. It's like, who am I without HIV? Yeah. And then, and the thing, and the, and, and when they ask me, when they tell me that type of statement, I have to look at, as you say, what you were saying about be the sense of fear that I don't belong anymore to this. So who am I? That sense of identity, the, the stop. But we need to change that mm -hmm. to say, even if you are cured, you will always will be part of the HIV community. Yes. And don't be afraid of the changes. Embrace it. We don't tell cancer survivors, oh, you can't, you're not a part of the uh, community anymore. If when you're a cancer survivor, you also you are a be survivor. a cancer survivor. You carry the torch for the community. Exactly. And like people say to me, I and mean, then when I have actually, I have to tell people, listen, folks, I am going to be part of the HIV community mm -hmm. no matter what. Yeah. And people were like, oh, wow, thank you, Alan, for that. I felt like a... I didn't see you. You, you didn't leave, leave them behind. You leave it behind. So no, I was. You <laughs> left me behind. <laughs> it was not the opposite around. You yeah. left me behind, and I, I said to people, "I I am part of the HIV community, and I'm always going to be part. Yeah. So don't be afraid of the changes. But changes will happen." Thank you. Uh, well, we are 
Well, I feel like we could talk for hours, first yeah. of all. But we're running out of time. And so I do want to wrap, I need to wrap this up. You have a very busy schedule. I do as yeah, well. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and so let's see. What, what's next? I, what is next for Adam, the London patient, yeah. is to change the narrative of HIV, okay. is to embrace my role as ambassador of hope, to change the perception of HIV, and to work with the researchers around the world and to find a more feasible and curable for everybody. And I think we have to look, I want to be in the front about life after HIV and beyond. Mm -hmm. I want to lead the way because we need to find the nurses, doctors, and people to understand life after HIV. Yes. And the, your life doesn't, doesn't stop. When and you just because you're talking about life after HIV doesn't mean that we stop focusing on life with HIV. Yeah. Both can exist at the exactly. same time and they complement each other. Exactly. Because I want to find, I, I'm happy to be cured of HIV. I'm delighted. And as I say, I'm, but I, I want other people to experience that. I want people to be able to have the choices to find a cure and to live a healthy life. And one day, HIV is part of the history. It was a disease and it's, it's curable now and people don't have to be so stigmatized, so dis discriminatory behavior, we still face it day to day yeah. life. And that's what a majority is to change. It's a huge task, mm -hmm. but I'm willing to embark on that journey. Yeah. And it's gonna take a lot of people working together. Yes, and I will say to people, don't give up on hope, I never did. So keep, keep the faith, a cure will be happened. So I know it's difficult to believe, no matter where you are, but cure is on the way. And I'm working around the club with many, many research around the, the world to find a cure in different way. We're getting there, we will. So don't lose your hope. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you for coming <laughs> here. Thank you for having me in this lovely place. Yeah, well, I, I hope that we can, in the future, Yes. Have more conversations. Yes, of course. I, this is one of the best interviews I've ever had. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we um, connect on a lot of things, so yeah. I think we can have a lot of great yeah. conversations that are going to be beneficial to a lot of people. Because in the future, I want to do my podcast. Oh. Uh, it will be the alphabet and me, because every letter, like H for HIV, mm -hmm. C for cancer, mm -hmm. N for mental health, the alphabet and me in my podcast. Love That's it. what I want to do in the I future. Thank you. Um, people who want to follow you, what you're doing, where can yeah, they, they can follow me at Adam London Patient and in, in Instagram, at London Patient Hope and Twitter. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm online. They can in Facebook as well. They can have me Adam Castellejo. I'm there. Um, they can find me and follow me and see my journey. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye, folks. Bye. <laughs>